Dude, Leadership Redefined. Uh, I guess a holiday edition of Leadership Redefined. I think we have one more next week, but then we're going to take a little bit of a break. We have, of course, uh, Dr. Bernardo, Dr. Nunziato. Welcome. And we have a very special guest, someone who started at Stony Brook right around the little bit before me, Pat, I think. We have uh, Pat Malone from Stony Brook University. I'll let you introduce yourself uh, briefly, and then we'll get into a very unique perspective on leadership um, that you have uh, based on your experience and expertise. Well, thank you, Al. It's great to be here. Hello. Um, I am the Associate Vice President for the School of Professional Development and also the Assistant Provost for Engaged Learning. And once you get through that title, that's about enough I need to say about myself because it's, <laughs> it's an all-consuming kind of a job, but it's an exciting opportunity at the university. Excellent. Thank you, Pat. So, we, as always, with Leadership is Fine, we talk a little bit off air about what we're going to talk about here. And uh, in particular, there are a few things I'd love to highlight with you. Number one uh, is the fact that you, you really, uh, the majority of us, I'm, uh, we're both, we're actually K-12 and higher education administration, the three of us. Uh, but you bring a really interesting perspective because a lot of your experience, you came from that corporate training, corporate leadership piece. Um, and you have really wonderful perspective. I'd love to hear sort of your take on how that relates to the leadership in that space relates to K-12 or higher ed in particular, in your case. Like, how does that all interrelate? What is your perspective on leadership overall as far as the corporate space goes? And, and then we'll get into the economic piece uh, as well and how that sort of transcends into that piece. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, that's a really interesting question because I think leadership is a very big word. You know, when we say leadership, we all think about some aspect of it. And so it's very important to sort of contextualize what dimensions of leadership we're talking about, what environments, what place and time. But what I've learned over the years in working with um, corporations and a variety of industry sectors that span private for profit, nonprofit, community service, government agencies, and manufacturing, pharma, is that organizations struggle with how to develop good leaders. And very often they get confused about who's a good manager and who's a good leader. And when I take a look at leadership across the board and I've explored different dimensions of leadership from women in STEM, sort of the emerging leaders and then the most experienced ones as well as um, corporate executive leadership, it's truly a sort of an evaluation of what the goals and mission of the organization are. What is the strategy? What is the vision? You know, sort of what is the commitment for that environment? And then how do we cultivate people that demonstrate the vision and the leadership skills in a way that allow the individuals in the organization to thrive, to be part of something bigger than themselves as individuals, but to also retain their individual identity, their passions, their loves, their their ways of dealing with things. So leadership to me transcends an environment, but takes more stock of the individual's strength as a leader, sort of who they are and how they assert themselves in parallel to the organizational goals and objectives, the mission, and then taking that, that part, we talk about emotional intelligence and we look at all different ways to develop this sort of empathy. It's truly about, of understanding the team you have, understanding the different roles people play and what they bring to the table and finding some way to have it all synchronized. You know, I think we had a conversation not too long ago about jamming, sort of the way different instruments come together and all of a sudden create something bigger than themselves without a totally scripted way. But it, leadership is about somehow coalescing all those dimensions. But the bigger piece of leadership is how its imperatives change based upon the environments that we're in. So it's, it's hard to talk about leadership today as we sit in the middle of a pandemic, as we sit in the middle of a year that has allowed our school districts and our companies and our educational institutions and our families create strategies and coping mechanisms and ways to create a new normal that lasts for a tiny amount of time and then shifts again. You know, so. The, the word on the table now is it's constantly in a state of flux and change that outside ourselves, outside our organizations, there are impacts that we need to respond to. So I do think that this year has created and probably will for years to come in the literature, a definition of leadership that 
is quite different in terms of what our basic strategies would have been prior to this. Do you think, Pat, do you think that, just a follow up to that, and then I wanna hear from Anthony Rich as well. Do you think that our definition or sort of that, that fit for a quality good leader has changed since the pandemic or has, as my dog chimes in the background, apologies, or has it just kind of said, this has, ho- has always been important and now the, the pandemic has stressed the importance of that. Like, which one do you think it was? I would have to tell you over the past few weeks of experiencing a variety of different educational programs and venues that we've run, I think it's changed dramatically in that, you know, we would talk a lot about wellness. We would talk a lot about making sure people were, you know, feeling safe and feeling sane and that they were addressing their, you know, mental health and and their work environment. I think right now, no one can be in a leadership position that doesn't take into account the the safety and the relationships of those people that are working for them. First and foremost now, I think that we have people that are struggling in ways that we can't even imagine. Each one of us has a different set of circumstances, but between the news and the bombardment of the educational environment coming to remote learning and the lines of where you work and when you work being totally blurred by being at home and having classrooms in the background and Zoom meetings with boards on the front and dogs in the background, The human element has become center stage. And I am hoping that that will be a silver lining going forward, that we truly learn to nurture and cultivate the mental health and the security and the interpersonal relationships among those people that work for us. Because now in the past several months, we knew in the beginning, and now it's becoming sort of like this this COVID fatigue, keeping away from the sense of isolation is really important. People need to be part of something, a community, a team, a family, something. And we've had to create venues to support that. So in some ways it redefines what a team is and sort of the nurturing of a team and how we create that dynamic. So I do think it's changed dramatically. I love that the human element has become center stage. Really wonderful. Anthony Rich. Go ahead, Anthony. Pat, I have to say, you so nicely articulated and framed um, the issues surrounding leadership and particularly um, with the, the COVID uh, challenges that, that leaders are, are faced with. And, you know, as you were speaking, I kept thinking about the implications of what you were saying for leadership training, for leadership programs, whether it's K-12 or the corporate world. And yeah, I just, if you can just extend your thoughts on, because we ask this question a lot, what do you think the post COVID world will look like? We asked that question in terms of classrooms, but what do you think the post COVID leader will, will look like? How would you characterize the post COVID leader? Well, I think the post COVID leader, after they get a little bit of a holiday break and start to, you know, get the post COVID leader is going to be very tired, but they're also, I think, we not only are going to be very aware of how we manage our own energy, right? That we have to truly take stock of the fact that we keep refilling the well. We go back and somehow, whether it's music or exercise or nutrition or family, whatever it is that we use to sort of do a soulful piece to keep ourselves more balanced, that then will allow us to move forward and offer that to others because I think that moving forward, we have many months and many years to get back to a place of some sense of normalcy, some sense of less uncertainty. So it's the long haul. And I think that we need to continue to support those individuals around us um, as we move forward. So I think that's what's going to look different. I also think that um, we are starting to blur the lines with the, you know, and being in K through 12 environments, we're blurring the lines of parents at home with children and learning remotely and kind of creating this way that people have had a chance to spend more time with their families. In some ways there's been a silver lining where little children are able to see their parents much more often than they would have been. Um, Going back to that, I think we're gonna have to make some adjustments in terms of how we how we raise families and nurture children and kind of look at the more holistic approach to ourselves as communities. That's very nice. I'm smiling. Wow. I, I, I love the way you, I love the way you future. 
<laughs> I love the way you feature because what you do is, and this is not, not our first conversation, uh, I love the way you recognize that the ripple effects of, of a given f- potential future you know, are born a lot more futures. And I love the way you just pull the family piece into that. That was, that was, uh, that was really good. So kudos on that. And I'm not surprised because you're, I really appreciate the way your mind works. Uh, I, I'm, I'm stammering because I, I, I want you to know I really do. One thing I think I'm hearing, and I'm also basing this on, on, on some of our previous conversations, uh, again, is the futuring word, and I, to use a, a, a metaphor, I hear, I, I think I hear it, and I also can see by virtue of some of the actions I've seen you uh, take, I, I see that you recognize that we need to rearrange the chess pieces. And to continue my one of my tortured metaphors, a different metaphor, I like the way you sometimes, and this is an extreme, uh, extreme metaphor. I like the way you create what I would call odd couples by combining a, a person X with person Y uh, with person Z and person D to see what will evolve. Is that the way you want? Is, is that a normal? I, mean, I assume it's part of your normal style of leadership. But uh, how much more do you think this is, this is uh, a necessity for a post-COVID uh, environment? I think actually there's an incredible amount of creativity that comes out of that type of, you know, odd coupling, pairing off. Um, What I think going forward is that we keep talking about the ways to spark innovation and creativity. So a good leader is looking at the the, sort of the, uh, the health and productivity of the individuals working for them, the ability of them to synchronize as a team and move towards common goals the objectives of the organization, the mission and meeting the metrics on that. But also one of the things that I've heard from employers, I did a focus group last week with my corporate board, was that the piece that they're missing, and these are very high tech organizations, you know, architectural firms, national laboratories, whatever. They are missing the in-person dynamic of innovation and team building, the ability for people to relax in an environment at work. Many of them have set up sort of game rooms and things where people come and coalesce and then come up with some great idea. So I do think that we we need to find ways to mix and match our different perspectives. We would talk in leadership program and the women in STEM, we would talk like the foundation would be gender and diversity in organizations and cultures fosters creativity as we start to look at things from a different perspective and we bring together all different dynamics, you know, Google, Facebook, all of the high-tech firms have known that. They need to see sort of what is the user experience. I think now through this, we're finding different people have different skills and we're seeing a different dimension in them. But going forward, the interpersonal dynamic that we start to foster in addition to sort of the virtual world, I think is gonna expose us to very different ways of seeing things because we have to come together as a society to save our economy and to save our world. We have a lot of work to do going forward to recover from this pandemic. So I think a lot of those silos of where the educational community and where the business community are broken down because the teachers are teaching and the companies are working and we're all co-mingling in environments with little children and animals and whatever. But so I think somehow we're gonna start to coalesce some of those interconnected pieces going forward because we've all been in the same work environment, virtual. Yeah, well said. Pat, you mentioned, uh, as we wrap up here, I do wanna touch on uh, the diversity piece, the, uh, the uh, obviously uh, coming from three white male Italians, um, we, we, we appreciate that you are a woman that has really gone up the ranks and not just gone up the ranks, you focus on that diversity and you actually have run women in STEM, for example, and others you've told me about. Can you speak to uh, just briefly about how uh, how you've sort of ascended into a really um, established esteemed position where you are now um, uh, as being a woman, what that means and what it means as far as being a female leader. Um, and then maybe a couple of the things that you're doing in that space 
Uh, some women will just go up the ranks and just stay there and be happy with that and kudos to them. But you have done that and you've also uh, embraced a lot of different programs and, and helped uh, expedite and, and, and move forward a lot of different programs in this area. So can you just speak to that piece? Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, you know, when, when I was hired at Stony Brook, I came out of Manhattan and I was working with major companies. I was starting to start the Center for Corporate Education. Well, you know, the best laid plans. I step into the defense downsizing. I didn't come from a defense family, so I knew nothing about what that really meant. I came from a family who worked in Manhattan in industry and not for profit and publishing. So I had to learn pretty quickly what that was, but mostly I had to learn to survive, which was I had to create a job for myself dealing with people who were out of work as opposed to people who were in work. Now, because I had come from a placement agency in a skills-based environment, I had a sense of it, but not what it would look like in a major research university. Long story short, I put together the pieces, I got some funding and I started this program for dislocated professionals from the defense industry and wound up finding myself immersed in the manufacturing sector. And in those days, I was the only woman showing up at these manufacturing firms, these machine shops, the whole aerospace network. So not only was I the only woman in a male dominated environment, but I was a woman from the state, whatever that meant to them. So I had to constantly keep sort of redefining what my value add was to their life as opposed to who I was. <laughs> and so doing, it put me in touch with dealing with innovation in economic resilience. Sort of that was the cornerstone. And at that point, I started to move in direction. So you can't help but look at supply demand, changing landscapes of employers, you know, diversity and cultural changes. You know, the manufacturing sector was really the microcosm of what was happening in terms of the influx of people working on the shop floor and language and literacy barriers. And in seeing that, it, it, it became more, I'm more worked around the work and the objective of the work than who was in it. But I think I probably learned to survive by being at a table with men running aerospace manufacturing firms just because of my mission at Stony Brook. So it kind of was a baptism by fire for me. And it made me tremendously empathic about supporting their needs to create a workforce and to adapt to the changes that were necessary for them. And then also starting to look at the economic impacts of diversity and inclusiveness and how we move forward as a community. Anthony Rich, follow. No, well, well, well said, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back, Pat, and, and get deeper into some of these issues that you're bringing up. Uh, you know, as, as Al is laying out and you're talking about, you know, gender and leadership, um, that's another area that I think there's a difference between the approach of men and women to those jobs. And you were saying, you know, you, you were saying things that, um, to me, were more empathetic to the people you were dealing with who were finding themselves out of work or having to change, which we don't always find on the male side of, of leadership. And um, I think that that those kinds of differences are, are what we benefit. I mean, we institutions and organizations, you know, from those different views, like you were talking about the diversity of STEM and, 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 and women. Um, that's a, a, a train we should never get off. Um, and I think that we have to keep moving. And unfortunately, we have to do that in the K-12 world too, because it's been far too much a, a male, and I'm talking about leadership, been far too long a male dominated profession. I'm happy to see that that's changing. Um, and we can only benefit from that in the K-12 world. So, you know, well, well put, hopefully someday we'll be able to have a much more deeper conversation than that. That would be great. That would be great. I have two points, one just to piggyback off what Anthony was saying. I noticed uh, the other day that Dr. Fauci pointed out to someone, I forget who he pointed it out to, but it was a, kind of a critic. Uh, I'm not sure, that, that, may be, that may be unfair. I know he definitely pointed out that an African-American female- yes, he did, I heard that. Uh, was the person who really uh, created the vaccine. I think it might've yes. been Pfizer. Yeah, and if you think about that on this rhetorical point more than anything, more than anything else, uh, if we had tied our, her arm behind her, her back or our arm behind our back, who else would have come, come up with that? It's just, it's just really kind of scary when we think about how we often will tie our corporate, I don't mean corporate with a capital C, with a small C, our corporate thinking uh, to exclude people 
who can contribute to the to the uh, uh, safety in our case of all. That's uh, kind of frightening that it, we often will forget that. And the other point I want to make, I really want to save this for uh, Adam. We're going to. Uh, so uh, we're going to enlist you again, I, I would hope, up the road, and hopefully you can make the time for us. I want to talk about this innovation theme. Uh, the research about innovation has been translated, in my view, uh, to a buzzword known as design thinking. And it's, 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 its roots really go back to the early 50s when you think about the idea of how, how naturally creative are people versus whether or to what extent they can be taught to be creative. And there's a lot of research to show that people can be taught to be creative. And, and it's not one thing just to throw people in a room and say, okay, don't come out until, cre until you create the vaccine. There, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a system, that's the wrong word, but there's a, a process in place that uh, nurtures creative muscles. And the fact I think that you, uh, instinctively, if not consciously recognize that, is a, a component of leadership that I'd like to explore some more with you because I'm not so sure it's as common as we would like to think that it is, but that's for another conversation, but we'd be here another, another hour if we did that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Pat, we're gonna, we are going to wrap up, but if you wanna just quickly comment on, on what Rich was mentioning, because you, you do, I mean, he mentioned the odd couple piece before, but you do have a knack of connecting the right people um, so that you you can they can basically create and innovate, right? So yeah. and and to do that, you have to know people. You have to be able to empathize. You have to understand others. Um, you can't just be like, okay, Al goes with Anthony, and that's good. You, you have to know uh, skill sets and backgrounds and personalities and all that stuff. Um, so can you just really speak to uh, Rich's point quickly? Then we'll wrap up and uh, be respectful of, of your time, of course. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the creativity piece is one that we also need to redefine. I think that people can be incredibly creative, but often they feel the boundaries. That's why the design thinking exercise of building is fun, it's play. And so I think back to that part, it's the interrelationships where you start to feel like your guard is down, you talk to somebody, and if you keep people focused on common goals, like, you know, people's passion is to educate, right? We know very often we gravitate to different fields and different kinds of work because there's something about it that we think is important. As we spend our days in this life, something important, some goal, some path with a heart. When you put people together and you sort of get them to connect on that more intrinsic level and then start to move towards how would we do this differently, magic happens. And so that I have the fun in creating the relationships that create magic, but they're also very much starting on the same page with mm. similar goals and visions. So it, we can go much deeper in that, but it's, it's great stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Uh, real quick, uh, just uh, to sum up, Rich, any final thoughts, Anthony, and then uh, we'll give Pat the last word. Uh, thoughts from Rich or Anthony? Rich, you're muted. Very quickly, I've, I've already said my piece. Uh, so much appreciate that you were able to give us this time. I, I'm certain I would bet my house on the fact that uh, anyone who listens to this will come away with some uh, premises they, that will uh, keep them up, up awake at night a little bit. And that's, and that's what we want to have happen. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, Pat, for not only coming on, but for uh, giving a lot of food for thought, um, particularly about leadership. And, and I'm just sorry that our time is so short that we really couldn't expand on some of these concepts that you've been mentioning. So I do hope you, you, you come back uh, and I, I'm sure you're gonna be doing great things over in Stony Brook, uh, which is a great organization and institution. So best of luck to you. So uh, Pat, same here, thank you so much. Uh, I've known you for a long time, but uh, even in this uh, brief amount of time, I've learned a little bit more about you. So I appreciate you sharing um, and uh, just exploring leadership overall and leadership in, as, as a woman, uh, all that really appreciate and uh, helping me get a better understanding of who you are, you are and, and who you represent, what you represent. Uh, final thoughts, Pat, from you, and then we'll close out. Sure, well, I'd like to thank the three of you for inviting me today. A million ideas is, are running through my head as we talk. There's so many dimensions of this, but I do think we're in a, an incredibly important time in that we, collectively are transforming higher education. And as a result, we're gonna be transforming 
K through 12 education and generally how we use education in its variety of methods to transform our lives, to address and solve our problems and to kind of create a resurrection into a new economy. So it's, it's the time for a lot of really good work and a lot of thoughtful approaches to how we do things. So thanks again for allowing me a chance to speak with you today. Thanks so much, Pat. And uh, we will, I'm sure, be uh, talking soon and hopefully have you on again. Thanks so much.